We're at the crossroads with MDB. That's right. We're at the crossroads, pointing the compass. How do we how do we move on from here? What do we talk about? What are we into today? Well, you know, I've been breaking these albums down. It's been so interesting for me to do the research on albums that I love and learn stuff that I never knew. So that is one uh, yet another, you know, special feature of the DVD of Little Stevens Underground Garage, as it were, you know, that one learns stuff. Because I want to, you know, entertain you and provoke you and, and give you some info. So dig it. Today, The Doors. The Doors, the first album produced by Paul Rothschild, came out on a lecture in 67. It was recorded, it was recorded in August of 66, and it was released in 67. And, you know, the song, The Doors really, you know, there's a lot of ground to cover here. Um, and I don't want to, um, you know, go on for too long. But this is one of the albums that everybody must possess, or a handful you know, I, I'd love to know the top 10 albums that you would take to a, uh, a desert island after the apocalypse, um, because perhaps that is around the corner. So better start collecting your uh, your downloads. Oh, you can't even do that, can you? No. Oh, my goodness me. Uh, you know what we'll all have to do when the apocalypse comes? Somebody will have to sing, remember a song and learn a song and just sing it on the desert island. No electricity, no computers. OK, hit it. Brown sugar, the stars. Let's do it. You know, like they used to do in the olden days when they would remember old stories of the victories and struggles of the of humanity. Anyway, Doors, unbelievable. 65 they started. Ray started the band with Robbie. And then they got Jim. And they performed at the Whiskey. And it was incredible. They created this mythology. Jim captured the audience with his absolute daring and courageous antics um, and attracted this enormous attention from record companies because they the charisma of Jim and the brilliance of the music rooted in the blues but also very much part of a, a poetic tradition an erudite literary tradition so they signed they signed to Electra and and the great thing about um, their producer Paul Rothschild and the engineer Bruce Bartnett was they recognized the uh, the, po the poetic sensibility of the band you know it, it and there was so much experimentation going on at that time and Rothschild is quoted as saying and it's interesting because he was the perfect guy because he understood jazz and rock and roll and poetry and how it mixed together he says quote things were wonderful in the 60s because it was an era of intense experimentation Everyone was trying to out-hip each other. With The Doors, we tried to strike a very fine line between being very fresh and original and being documentary, making the record sound like it really happened live, which is very, very interesting. And, you know, he was there through rehearsals. And what they realized very early on was Jim was unpredictable. Jim was unpredictable in terms of profanity, not in terms of his genius, but because, you know, he was profane. So it was difficult to put that stuff together. And it was a new medium for The Doors um, to do an album. They could play live. They knew how to do that backwards and forwards. And, it, you know, it was done. It's so interesting, you know, when you think about The Doors going into a studio for the first time. And according to Paul Rothschild, the entire album was done on a four-track recorder. And for the most part, they only used three tracks. He recorded bass and drums on one track, guitar and organ on another, and Morrison on another. And he overdubbed Morrison every now and then just to give it that sort of eeriness that it had. And in 66 at Sunset Sound, they had one of those great echo chambers. So they, that vocal sound was great. And by the way, Morrison never considered himself a great singer. And he was just a phenomenal singer. You know who he loved? You know what he really listened to for breathing and technique? Frank Sinatra. Well, Jim put the sin in Sinatra, didn't he? But he was a big student of singers. He used to listen to Elvis and so on and so forth. But he credits Frank with being his, his most influential um, guy. You know, the guy that he really, really wanted to approximate in terms of in the moment. Because if you listen to those great singers, the, the definition of great singing is they're singing it for the first time right in front of you, which we've discussed in the past. So there you have it. Uh, you know, th the key track, of course, being the end which has got to be the one of the greatest songs. I mean, that experience, Rothschild and Bartnick, the producer and the engineer, can you imagine being in that studio and listening to this thing coming back at you? 
Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's such a complex song. And, it, you know, they recorded it completely dark, except for the lights on the recording console and a, and a candle burning next to Jim. And Rothschild, on record, quote, I was totally overwhelmed. Normally, the producer sits there just listening for all the things that are right and anything about to go wrong. But for this take, I was completely sucked up into it. Absolutely an audience. We were about six minutes into it when I turned to Bruce, the engineer, and I said, do you understand what's happening here? This is one of the most important moments in recorded rock and roll. <laughs> 